Hi. <laughs> uh, how are you all doing? Let me just open this a little bit more. Okay, so how well did you do with the one word um, graphic assignment, your one word message on Photoshop? Did anybody get to that assignment yet? Or are you still working with the other assignment with the masking? I think what we're going to do today is just we're going to look. Um, let me go to chat for a second. Okay, so Anthony's working on it. Do you want to show it? Do you have anything that you want to share that you feel is ready enough to share? Or do you want to wait until next class when they're due? Um, it's up to you if you want some feedback on it. Okay, and Liliana also. Okay, that's fine, Marissa. Yeah, because we're going to yeah look at that. We're going to look at a couple of videos early and then you can come back in and look at the um, demonstration later. I'm just going to review a lot of the stuff that we've done on Photoshop already. Okay, yeah, you can wait to work on it some more if you want to. Okay, yep, that sounds good. Does anybody want to share? It doesn't have to be that assignment. It can be any assignment that you've worked on. If you have something that you've finished for the prior assignments, because everybody's in a different place. And honestly, if you had submitted anything, I gave you a grade for the midterm because I know how hard it's been to get up to speed with the computers and the work that's been done so far in Photoshop. I'm really happy with it. I think that, you know, you're doing a really nice job in the works that have been handed in. It is more time consuming. I can see to complete these in a home situation. So don't panic about having them in at exactly the same time. But do share them from time to time because it's good. this is your chance to get the feedback from the other students and from me uh, before you do your final revisions. Uh, I did hear from a couple of people that are waiting till the end of the semester to submit everything, which because you can revise it, you know that is an option. But it's not the best option usually for people because what happens is that last week is a crush with this class and with other classes too. So to watch all the videos and to, um, you know, because you haven't been getting the feedback from the class in Photoshop, you don't have that information. So it's harder to get caught up. So I would, even if you don't finish, finish them, if you can submit them, you know, from time to time in class so we can discuss them, that keeps you on track too for getting the assignments done without having that last, um, part of the semester crush. So, okay, Liliana, yeah. Yeah, if you want to upload and also Wendy, um, Liliana, your chat came in first. So if you want to share the screen, let me just make that an option in the security. Okay, and then if you'd like, you can show it and then we'll look at Wendy's. Okay, um, how do I share my screen? Okay, you should be able to in Zoom just have your window up for share screen and then click on the bottom where all the menu options are and it has share screen there. And I just I activated the share screen in the security settings here so um, it should show up but if not, I can share your screen for you. Or I'll just share the screen from Blackboard. One second. Okay. While you're doing that, I'm going to open Blackboard just in case. Do you have them loaded to Blackboard? Because we can just do that. Yeah, they are. I'm on Blackboard right now. Okay. So are they in, where are they? They're in my final portfolios. Okay. Mm -hmm. So which ones do you want to show? The silhouettes for now? Yeah. All right, I'm going to share that screen. Thank you. And here we go into Liliana's portfolio. And that's great that you've got everything there. That's how it should look. I mean, it's just, it's really nicely organized. And in the end, it's so much easier 
um, when you're going to upload the portfolio for the final grade. So that's fantastic. Um, do you want to look at this one first, the warm silhouette? Sure. Oh, wow. Okay. So do you want to talk about it? How did you do it? What's your idea behind it? Um, so for the two silhouettes, I kind of wanted to do like uh, spooky, like Halloween vibes, but in different ways and like different, like, like, uh, like, like um, ways to like bring on that. So for this one, um, I wanted to do more of like a, like a warm, uh, like witch type feel to it. And so I have like my silhouette, which I um, took and it took a while to get it actually like silhouetted because I couldn't get my room dark enough, but it worked out. And then okay. I found, um, I found the, all the pictures on Pinterest for all my photos. I usually find them on Pinterest yeah. and, um, and on my phone and email them to myself and save them to my computer. And I found the pictures of the um, silhouetted cat and I felt that like the cats would go along with it well because um, of like how witches like have familiars and stuff like that. So I just felt that um, they would tie in well with it to give it more dimension. And um, I used um, the masking tool for um, each of the silhouetted uh, things and I used the dodge and burn uh, a lot for um, to help the silhouettes stand out and then I also really nice used the outer glow for the uh, cats. Okay great so what do you guys think do you have any comments you can post them in chat and then I'll, when we go out from screen sharing I'll have to read them then but if you want to you know talk about it verbally now Here's your chance. <laughs> okay, I mean, I really, my screen is a little dark just because this room is bright. So I just saw the edges of the cats, but I love the idea with the, I mean, it's very subtle, your divisions between the silhouettes, which I like about it. It's a different feeling. They kind of flow into one another and that's really beautiful. Um, I like the background. I mean, all the repeating patterns. It's very interesting what you did with the, yeah, the patterning, very similar color palette, nice limited palette. And then just separating them a little bit with the layer styles, the outer glow, and then also your, I mean, this is really nice using the burn tool. That's a great idea around the edge of that silhouette. So that almost becomes a frame for this witch in the center that's kind of walking through the silhouette. That's a beautiful double layer, sort of double meaning. Oh, I like that a lot. That came out really nicely. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, it's spooky, but it's also, it's got, I don't know, an upbeat feeling to it, I guess because of the cats and the yellow leaves yeah. and the pumpkins. I mean, did you want it to be that way, kind of a combined? Yeah, I kind of wanted this one to be like, um, spooky Halloween but also kind of a little bit more like warmer and like uh, upbeat feeling to it with like the other one has more of like a darker feeling to it. This one does I mean it has a little dark feeling I mean that witch is definitely scary because yeah, the outline, yeah. <laughs> it's creepy. it reminds me of Freetown State Forest. <laughs> Um, it's very creepy. I like that about it. I mean, it's just, but it's that excitement about Halloween I kind of feel for, and you know, this season, how, you know, these are all the elements, the sort of natural elements combined with the mysterious ones that are really, you know, the thing that's so exciting about the season. So I really like what you did with the silhouettes. It's beautiful. And this area up here, I mean, leaving this, I mean, it's sort of the supporting area. It doesn't have as much patterning or overlay as down here, but you need that in such a complex composition and it supports it really nicely with these lines kind of leading back down into the center where the head is that's beautiful and this kind of falling where the eye might be this kind of negative space between the tree branches is very nice um, I guess my only suggestion would be like this shape right here where it's the cat's ear kind of going into this part of the chin where you have a natural indent is one of those um, sort of tension places where it doesn't overlap, but it's not behind. So, I mean, that's the only thing where it kind of becomes a focal point because of that, because it's poking into the chin where the chin naturally goes in. 
I mean, you can move the cat down just a tiny bit maybe and just overlap a different part of the chin or have it, you know, over a little bit so there's a space and then you wouldn't have that tension area. But other than that, I mean, I think it's like, I love this diagonal composition along with this cut here on the third of the horizontal with the trees. That's really nice. So is there anything else you wanted to do with it or do you feel like this one's completely finished? Um, I feel like they're completely finished. I'm pretty happy with how they came out. Yeah, it came out beautiful. Have you tried to print it yet? Do you have a printer? I think I asked um, No, I haven't tried printing them yet. Even if you have to send them out, you know, you can also just bring them into places like Walgreens. They make nice prints now. It used to be that they didn't, but, you know, Office Max Walgreens just for a few dollars can make a really nice laser print that would pick up those colors and frame it. I mean, it's beautiful. Um, let's look at the other one. Um. <laughs> So this is the cool silhouette. So do you want to talk about this one? Um, so basically I wanted a similar feel to the other one, but in a like contrasting way. So they give off like similar feelings, but also kind of different feelings at the same time. I don't really know how to explain it, but um, I wanted to keep with the like Halloween, like spooky feel. So. I, um, instead of having like another witch, I wanted to go like completely different and have more of like a ghost and like haunting feeling to it. And um, for like the animal uh, part of it that I wanted to incorporate, I, I just thought bats would look really cool um, incorporated into it and um, get the purple and cooler tones in there. So I placed um, those around it. Any comments? Oh, and also um, for this one, instead of doing the burn on the inside of the silhouette, I wanted to do it on the outside of the silhouette to also contrast from the other picture. That makes a big difference. It's interesting how that works. The other one feels like a three-dimensional form, the way that you use the burn on the inside. It sort of puffs out the center so it looks 3D, so that human is almost existing there with that image projected on it. And then this one with the projection in the back or doing the burn around the edge, it looks like it's on flatter paper, almost like something that's been torn from paper. Um, or a memento where the background and the bats look more dimensional. So that's a nice flip of that styling between the two. It's similar, but it's the polar opposite. And um, the ghost, did you want to find something or why did you pick that particular ghost in the house? Um, I felt that uh, that ghost had a lot of dimension to it. And I also just um, liked the, I felt that the house looks creepy and the ghost stood out a lot. So I felt that that picture worked best for it. Yeah, I really, that ghost is so creepy <laughs> because it looks human. I mean, it's one of those old fashioned, you know, when people just throw a sheet over themselves and, you know, cut out the eyes. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I, I, I think someone um, took a picture of them with a sheet and it's like that. That's what it looks like. I mean, it's, it's really sad in a way. It's got a sad sort of really melancholy feeling because of that. Like it looks like somebody's memory or their house is so old, you know, it's a memory or maybe it was just broken down when that happened or maybe it's a metaphor um, for memories about what went on there. But it's really scary too. I mean, you feel sorry for it, but it's frightening because it's human. So, I mean, to me, I think that that's a really nice choice of ghost rather than something that was, you know, done with computer graphics or something that is trying to simulate what a ghost might look like if they were real. I like this and the house is beautiful. I like the way, again, it, as in the other one, you position the images on the silhouettes really nicely with those sort of fall trees fading into the face to give yourself a face and let the silhouette show up, but also the trees sort of start to become connected with the meaning of the face. I mean, it's just, it's really, really nice. 
And I like the badge. That's a great choice because, and that they're not dark people, you know, it's something that they're scared of and they expect them to sort of just be a shadow, but they become a focal point with that purple. And that's really nice with the um, background. And also that tiny sliver of moon helps that composition so much. Did you look for that one on purpose to have that there? Or? Yeah, with the picture, when I was playing around with um, what like part of the photos I wanted to show within the bat, um, I really wanted that moon in there because I thought it would look really cool. It's amazing. I mean, that would just drop away. I think that part of the composition up here, if you didn't have it, um, it would still be nice, but I mean, this sort of brings your eye up and around and then a along with the bats and then back down through the ghost. So you get that circling gaze of the viewer, which is always really desirable because they stay with it. I mean, I just want to keep looking at it. It's so interesting to look at. Um, I like the black neutral background again as supporting material, but just like what you chose to drop in the bats as silhouettes is nice because it's close to the background. So you sort of, it's relatable but it's like they live in a different world, almost like this is sort of their parallel universe, but it's close to ours or they're looking, you know, because they're flying, they're looking in a different direction. So that shows it to me. I mean, I really, really like that about it. And this also becomes the focal point, like the ghost leading up to this point because they're so similar. And then the points in the bat, that also takes the eye around, but this is a real nice connection here between the two windows and then the two eyes and that ghost, which is, you know, they're tiny, but really a focal point and prominent in the image. That's a very cool intersection. <laughs> so those kind of things can really tighten up a composition and make it something special. I mean, that people want to keep looking at, and that's definitely got it. And, you know, you're using stuff from Pinterest, but again, you know, with our remixing idea, you've changed them up so much that they have a totally new context new color and new meaning so they become yours you know with all the steps that you've taken to unite them um, in both of these compositions and then the two compositions together another context because it's a kind of a you know a dual tip diptych um, so really really nice job yeah you definitely have to get these printed <laughs> I think they're really beautiful. I mean, just to save, you know, even, in, you know, back them up, but just to get them off the digital realm into something solid would be really nice. So great job. Thank you. Do you do photography? I mean, is that, or what is your major? Oh, um, I'm an art education major. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the photos, you, you know, you could start collecting if you like this process, you know, photos that you might want to use in the future that are yours so you get all the resolution that you want. Um, but yeah, it's working with the found images though, really nice selection. So great job. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share so I can go out and let, Wendy, do you want to share on your side or do you want me to get your work off of Blackboard? Oops. Um, I have, I have. Do you want to share it? Let's see. Let me read the chat while we're waiting a second. Okay, great. Okay, can you guys see Wendy's screen? Okay, do you want to talk about this one? Okay. Um, while we're here, I'm not sure if he's having trouble with audio, um, but I'm just going to like go over it. Okay. Are you there? Okay. So do you want to talk about it, Wendy? Mm. Let me switch out for a sec. Hello? Okay, there you Hello? are. Oh, All right. Okay, <laughs> okay so go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this was a picture that I took from my camera when I went to Tokyo with my cousin. Uh -huh. And yeah, um, I took this. Um, I think it was doing a, a tour. A oh, tour. Beautiful. And, yeah. 
Yeah, um, that was one of that place was one of my favorite. I think because how, like how it was really beautiful, and I was like, yo, I should take a picture of this. And、What、today I was、it? like, huh? What kind of site is it? Um, I think it was, uh, it was like a palace. I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's gorgeous. It was. It was like a tour. I I don't remember. It was a long time ago. But oh yeah. That was the tour, and like I seen a lot of sight, and I was like, really. But this one was the one that hit me the most, cause how like it was like fall, I think, on the fall season, and、yeah. it was beautiful, and I saw a lot of stuff, and I put this、um, as my main picture. Picture,、um, yeah. So I said plain sight as you. The mount is the plain sight. It's like around the mountain, and I was like, "Yeah, sometimes we don't notice these、um, beautiful things, and we just like pass by it, never notice it, and like we never enjoy the beauty of the earth. Like how earth give us some beautiful things that we never actually appreciated. So that was mostly what I was thinking about.、Um, yeah, that is.、Uh... I mean, I like that concept a lot for the text. I mean, I love the way you bent the text, but that reminds me. There was a painter, I think, in the 1980s that became really well known. That you know, his. I mean, they were oil paintings, and then he like put in one word with a landscape, like kind of to look. When I get his name, I'll post the images. But I like this in the digital realm even more so. I mean, it just feels. I don't know, less solid, more interesting, and more vibrant. But yeah, it was kind of like a reminder, like you're talking about to look. You know, you're in this world, and people don't look at it. I love that concept. No matter what environment we're in, we don't see. We're sort of in our bubble. That's really, really nice. Did you change the colors on some of the fall colors to make them brighter? Or was that really the original?、Um, te- uh, that's how it originally looked because it was、wow. like,、um, and then like. It, it it was it looks like that. So、um, oh, I want to go to Japan. <laughs> that is yeah, beautiful. Just to see the garden. Mostly, I think I like. I'm planning on going there next year.、Oh, um, lucky you. But yeah. yeah, there's some beautiful things in Japan that, like, I was like, I. That's why I, technically I I started loving Japan because I started watching anime. But like when、right. I went there,、right. that's that was like a whole different. Different style. I was like, yes. Oh, really? Yeah. The artwork or just the、um, country in general? Uh, the country and mostly the country. Wow. Yeah. No, it's so beautiful. There's so much history. I, I like the plain sight. That's really. I like it that it's subtle. That it's the color of the mountain, so it's not slapping you in the face. That the colors dominate,、um, but、yeah. it's sort of you know. Completely becomes part of the landscape, and it takes a second because if you're just first looking at it, it looks like texture that might be on the mountain, and then you see it as words. That's very, very nice. I mean, you could do a series of those. It would be an interesting show. I mean, with different landscapes or different, you know, it wouldn't have to always be landscape. But yeah, that's very interesting. So, any other comments? What do you think about the text in there?、Um, if you're commenting on the.、Um, You know the colors, which are gorgeous in the photo. How do you feel about the text being in there? Do you feel like it reinforces the message, or do you、um, prefer it without? I mean, it might be interesting too. I mean, you could do a pair, one with and one without, and then display them next to one another, or something like that. You know, if you were going to show them. To print them, I would definitely have it print out.、Um, the only thing I would suggest is just to, you know, design-wise, is just to move the T over here a little bit. It's one of those like tension points, which I'll always point out if I see them, because it connects right with that tree. So maybe, if, you know, even if you use like something to just bump it up a little bit, so there's a little bit of the mountain behind it to separate it from the tree, because that pulls it forward and makes it feel like it's part of the forward plane. Um, but that is the only thing. I mean, the composition is really nice. I mean, maybe stretching it over this way to this negative space so it goes behind the tree would help too.、Um, but I like how you have this up here, sort of the bright in the upper left-hand third, and then down here again a repeat of that bright, intense color with these leaves down here in the lower right third. And then this sort of becomes the supporting element that hooks it to the top right third. 
And so you're going around and around, you know, that brings the viewer's eye around the bright to the bright over here and then to this, you know, bright tower over here and back around and then this becomes a diagonal. And this is supporting material, but that's, you want some of that for the eye to rest there. So that works out really nicely. Um, yeah, and so Lillian said she likes the words how fade into the back and it feels like they're part of the mountain instead of just flat. You did a nice job with that. What tool did you use to do that? For the, um, for the words? Yeah. I use, um, I think it was the word, um, like the T, of, like when you use the words, I think oh, I good. used. Yeah. And then I used the color, change it. Like, no, coloring, no, the coloring was like pretty hard. So I had to just see which one can um, blend around the, um, the environment. So I used red and orange a little bit just to mix it. And then I yeah. used the fading out, um, oh, great. fading out auction just to make it look like it's like, like fading away a little bit. Yeah, that works really nicely to mix the colors too, because yeah, I can see how some of this purple when you use the opacity um, is coming through the text so that unites it with the background. And also up here, it's a little bit brighter. It picks up the warmer color. So that's a great technique to save you from having to go through and do every text, you know, part of the text with an individual color, which would be, you know, impossible. That's a great way to mix the colors just, um, you know, with light by using the opacity. That's great. Because I really just have that feeling with the, because of that mixture that the P is going way back in space, that that really does exist on a three-dimensional plane. And that illusion makes the composition so strong. And it kind of reflects also this point um, to the tower over here. You've got that nice like triple design element of the tower here, the tower here, and then you've got the tower in the, with the plane site, kind of the same triangle. So that is a really nice job. Yeah, it's great that you have that as an original photo. So yeah, keep collecting your images, organize them. I mean, because you can use them time and time again for this kind of collage for different things. But I'm glad you found something you, that's your own that you're able to repurpose for this particular assignment because it's a really nice work of art. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go out of the share for a second if I can. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Because <laughs> I always have trouble doing it from this side. I don't know why. Um, all right. Is there that that's beautiful, both of you guys. I mean, the quality of work this semester has just been awesome. So I'm really pleased. And you know, again, if you're still catching up, don't panic. I mean, you can go look at the videos as many times as you need to. I'll always put them up within an hour of class being over. And um, you should have enough time to catch up with the assignments. You can also look at each other's portfolios. I debated whether to leave them open for doing that, but I think it's good, you know, another way of sharing. Um, you can't go in and, you know, delete anybody's. You can only view them. So if you don't want that, you can set your portfolio to not be open to other people. But if you want people to be able to view, I think that's a good way for people that are catching up to go see what's been done and get some ideas. So that was really nice. Okay, does anybody else have anything to show? Um, you know, and it could be an old assignment, anything that you want, some advice on. I went back and looked at some of the um, portfolios and people had loaded up some of the, por the original portraits that we did. And, you know, those were probably the most time consuming assignment because you're painting by hand and seeing those, they were really beautiful. And, you know, obviously took a long time working on. So that's understandable that, you know, they would have been up there a little bit late. So congratulations for getting those done. The other assignment should go a little bit quicker, but I really enjoyed looking at those. There was a lot of work to them and they came out fantastic. Um, okay, I think, let's see. Um, I'm debating what to go. I, I think we'll save the review for last. I have a few videos that I just wanted to show from important artists that worked with text. So it might give you some ideas for the word project, even though some of this is moving work. So let me close the images and then I'm going to go back to share screen in a second. I have these in your videos folder in Blackboard. So I'm going to go to share screen now and we'll look at a couple of them. They're very short. Um, 
Okay, so this is a, um, above the everything is a remix now. I have a text art folder and I'll keep adding to that when I find things that won't all be video. But um, today it is. So the first is Barbara Kruger. Have any of you heard of her as an artist in your other classes? No. Probably not, yeah. I mean, she's somebody that was really popular in the 70s and 80s, and then you didn't see her work anymore. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. She is showing in museums now. You'll see her stuff from time to time. But she's somebody that had a lot of attention fast and yeah. then, you know, didn't last. But I really, she's my favorite of the text artists because she's using print and always making a political statement in a way that kind of cuts you. I mean, it really, she's subtle. It's not so direct, you have to think about it, but when you finally get some of her things, they're kind of shocking <laughs> and they make an impact. And also she was using print and putting a big poster, sort of poster bombing um, cities and doing billboards at a time when that was really hard for an artist to do. She came up with a big print processing technique a large print processing technique for her work. And she had a big impact on future digital artists. This was a time when she couldn't work digitally. She's doing a traditional layout with photography and text, but she's been very influential on the look of graphic design to follow and also using word statements as graphic design, as art, as sort of, you know, graffiti and political commentary for outdoor art. Wasn't so true. here she is. No, wait, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. I really never thought I could be an artist in the art world it sense of it. Fire drill, right, Ms. Gonzales? Okay, the fire drill. I didn't know anything about art worlds. I never had gone to museums. I had to get a job. So I left school at around 19 and just started working as an editorial designer. I would basically look at all the photographs that came in and I didn't have the text from the copywriters yet. So I would just take text over the photographs and said A, B, C, D, E, and they would write to my design. And what I realized is that my job as a designer pretty quickly morphed into my work as an artist. Why are you not upstairs? No, because she she was supposed because gun gun is not gun was not downstairs. I work with pictures and words because I think so. they have the ability to tell us and remind us where we've come from and where we're going. They have powers and pleasures and desires and disgusts. I'm very interested in the everyday. I love the everyday and its repetitions, its comforts. It's the events that make me nuts. I like the moments between events. I see myself within this pleasurable yet brutal culture. But I think that like most artists, I try to create commentary. You know, I've always said I have a short attention span, which connects me to digital culture. I went online and I found 500 images based on certain stylistics of my work. And I constructed a work using those images, none of which were made by me. The way my still images have traveled online in various forms done by myself and other people <laughs> is satisfying and amusing to me. I curated a show at the Museum of Modern Art, which I called Picturing Greatness, but the word greatness was in quotes. 
There were two texts and they were on the wall in the middle of the room, surrounded by images of artists. And the text basically focused on the arbitrariness of fame and prominence. There are so many visual practitioners whose work we don't know. And the reason is sometimes brutally arbitrary. I resist great claims made for my work. One of the great joys of being able to project your subjectivity into an image or an object or building means you don't have to be there physically. You don't have to be the face of your work. trying to find the window so I can turn her off for a second. <laughs> and hopefully another video won't come up, but I am going back there. Um, there we go. All right, good. Exit. There we are. Uh, and then close her. Okay. So yeah, if you have any comments while you're watching these, go ahead and post them into chat. Um, she was, I like her just because she kind of took me, I mean, she kind of shocked me with one of her posters. She was coming to Atlanta when I was there in school to visit, and I didn't know she was going to put anything up in the city. And so I was just walking around Piedmont Park, which is kind of in the middle of Midtown Atlanta, and around one building, she had a huge poster, and it was a picture of a dead animal on the street. I mean, she talks about, you know, the everyday, and, you know, she picks up, and you can see from her multiple images how she picks up ideas from her everyday life and what she sees on the street. But at first, I was offended about by it, because that was in black and white, and then around it, she had red and white letters that said, why do we suffer? But I kept thinking about that. I still think about it. And you know, it's sort of the ultimate question, why do we suffer? And I just, that image was so impactful. It was shocking. People complained about it eventually. They didn't want it there near the park and kids were upset by seeing it. But I think anybody that saw it has to think about that and how careless we can be you know, with the lives of other creatures. So I just admired her after that and kind of tried to follow her. I like her outdoor work better than seeing it in a museum, but really powerful um, typography. So yeah, I didn't know that either, Kaylee. I, yeah, I, have you, you heard about her before? I had no idea that she inspired um, Shepherd Fairy with a, a Bay poster, but now when I look at her work, I mean, the colors are so much like his work and he uses the black and white photo juxtaposed with the you know primary color text like her. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people haven't, she really, and you know, like I have to say what happens to a lot of female artists, not so much now, but you know, in the seventies and eighties, they were making inroads really before that didn't have much of a voice. I mean, even in the 1960s, early seventies, women had to ask their husband to use a credit card. Women could not get a credit card. It had to be your father's or your husband's or your out of luck. So having no voice and then suddenly coming into a time when women suddenly had a voice, and you see a lot of women doing text art, I think, but it doesn't have the same longevity sometimes as male artists. And um, I think that she sort of talks about that, but doesn't say it directly. 
But I do really like that she embraced the remixing idea and just had shows of other people that are remixing her work. She's like, okay, I'm not going to sue anybody or get upset about it. I'm going to take this work as an honor and put it back up in the gallery as my work. And that's brilliant. So um, yeah, I think that she's really, she's one of my favorites. I, we're going to look at another one, another woman who worked with text around the same time as her. She's still very well known and just had a show at Mass Mocha, still very powerful in the art world, but influenced other types of graphic designers and artists. She was working with light and sort of did early bil light billboards in New York City, where you'd be walking down the street in New York City and see one of hers poems or text compositions and not realize it wasn't advertising. So it would take people by surprise that way. So she also influenced a lot of digital artists, a lot of people that work with projection now as text artists, a lot of musicians that do that. So let me go to share a screen and back to Blackboard. And again, if you want to watch them again, these are all on Blackboard in your videos folder. So this is Jenny Holzer. And this is a short video. This is one of her projections. She turns every surface into a page. She illuminates not only the texts, but also our perception of those texts in the world. And by projecting these secrets into the night, she transforms these words of power into transitory bolts of lightning. If you think of a work as a chorus, language is one of the voices. Architecture and light are other voices. She wants the artwork to be like holding an electric wire, that there is real emotion there, but she also wants it to be beautiful. I think Jenny Holter's outstanding contribution to art is using technology and media in a very different way to get her messages across. Sometimes they're controversial, sometimes they're challenging, other times it just gets people thinking. There's the fear and the wonder and the desperation and the triumph and all those other emotions that make us human that she's dealing with. And when we experience them, we sort of understand ourselves more. You know, we develop our souls. Her art projects in the public space have something very seductive. They're very aesthetic and, and beautiful and uh, intriguing. But then the content is very tough and um, often very critical and it challenges people and it gets them to think and it gets them to question and gets people to change. Look, look deeply, <laughs> look in different ways than you've looked before. That's her genius. She stops people in their tracks because it's an expression of her own extraordinary intellectual curiosity about ways to change the way we look at the world. It's crucial that things change and she addresses it. It's not like things get done quickly, but she's addressing them as if they should be. For this award to come to Ginny Holzer is a way of saying to all artists, don't shy away from the tough subjects. Don't shy away from the controversial. Don't shy away from facing up to political or historical realities or challenges. Face up. Don't flee from the world around us. Don't just come sideways to the world around you. Face up. So it's a brave award for a brave artist. another one working with, I mean, text that's got a digital 
sort of footing. I mean, she was in the 70s and 80s again, but light, people were starting experiment with light. Computers were not easily accessible, but she started using some of the earliest computers and had some built for her to do these light displays, which was really innovative and also, um, you know, impressed a lot of people that use those te techniques later and she's much imitated. But her stuff, it went, especially on the architecture, it's so finely tuned to certain places that you don't notice as being anything every day. I mean, she can just like bring tears to your eyes if she just hits you in the right space with the right installation. And I saw that one with the revolving sort of um, circles of text at Mass Mocha, which is an old mill building. And it just sort of reflected the looms that used to work there. And it was really very powerful. And, you know, talked a lot of the text was about the workers. Uh, but I think I like her outdoor ones. Yeah, and the t-shirt. That t-shirt has been so much imitated. She's so influential. And finally, you know, she gets this award that she deserves. And, you know, I'm so glad to see that. I did, hadn't realized she received that. So it was nice to find that video. But her work is really, you know, I mean, it's just, it seems like text couldn't be so emotional. Um, but there's something about it. It's beautiful and it's, it's very, it creates a lot of emotions in the viewer. Um, so I'm going to go back to share screen for a second and do the uh, look at our last one. Um, uh, where are we? Actually, I'm going to quit this and then go back for a second and just shut up the video and reopen Blackboard because it's getting, I have too many windows open as usual. Whoops. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay, now I'll go to share screen. Okay, so the last text artist is Jean-Michel Basquiat. Have any of you heard of him? If you've taken art history classes, you may have because he's become really very famous, even though he's no longer alive, unfortunately. You know, he passed away at 27 years old, like a lot of musicians tend to hit that age and burn out. But in the time that he was alive, he just made the most influential artwork. And he started out, even though he's known for his visual art, he's interesting because he started out as a digital audio artist doing sound for, he was a DJ and he would mix his poetry. He did a lot of writing with music for his club shows. And he would also record people on their telephones when they didn't realize it. He'd call somebody and start a conversation that he wanted for one of his recordings and then he'd be recording the person and they wouldn't know it. <laughs> so he ran into issues with that, but it was really very interesting the way he put that kind of found spoken word into his music. Um, but eventually he started doing graffiti around New York City and um, was very he got a lot of good feedback for his work. People started stealing his work, so we knew people liked it off the walls. And he pursued Andy Warhol as somebody that he admired. He kept running into him in restaurants and showing his work or in different places and pursuing him to be his representative. So he really took hold of what he wanted to do. But before then, he was painting, and he just had this like beautiful text that would flow out of him that he combines with his images. And um, so here he is. This one's a little bit longer. So his work is very text heavy, very influential, but also brings in some other types of images. Jean-Michel Basquiat was an artist working in the later part of the 20th century. He was born in Brooklyn in 1960 and grew up against this cultural backdrop of this post-punk moment in New York. And he became this really extraordinary artist in the most plural sense. You know, he was a painter, he's become renowned as a painter, but he was also a musician, an actor, uh, he DJed, he made work in almost every medium and he's left a fairly indelible mark on our culture. He was very explicit about needing to have source material around him. 
even when you see filmed interviews with him, there's almost always in the background some kind of Looney Tunes cartoon. He would watch everything from kind of trashy TV through to surrealist films like Louis Bunuel. He was interested in Japanese cinema. Actually, it's an actual image of the moon. No, it's based on a drawing of the moon, but it's an image of Pluto. Yeah. And what, what's this? Uh, that's it's, a, it's a copyright. So in case, so I won't get sued for using the word Pluto by Walt Disney. Jesse Owens was the fastest human of his day, and he took both the 200 and 100 meter titles. Here's his lightning like form as he captures the 100 meter in 10.3 seconds, just a tenth slower than today's record. There's a fantastic painting which is about the black track and field athlete Jesse Owens. Owens famously raced in the so-called Nazi Olympics in Berlin in 1936 and thwarted all of Hitler's ambitions. So there's information about Jesse Owens and his life. We see little Nazi swastikas, anatomical drawings that suggest that physical prowess. But we also have all of these mentions of Superman. <laughs> And, of course, we know that Superman was a figure that Basquiat was really interested in. But we also might tap down a little bit more. Superman comes out in Action Comics in June 1938. And the developers, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, very much intended it to be a kind of counterpoint to the rise of the Ubermensch in Europe. So we cannot definitively say that Basquiat intended for those two things to be connected but we can drill down sufficiently to be able to understand that there are possible layers of meaning that might enrich our understanding of that work. People often think of Basquiat as a graffiti artist, and the question stems from the fact that this is how he started out. In 1978, with his high school friend, Al Diaz, he takes to the streets. <laughs> They write these kind of intriguing, enigmatic statements on the city. A huge buzz builds up. The name Samo comes from them really laughing about the street jargon of, you know, how you doing Samo Samo, which stood for kind of same old shit. People become kind of obsessed about who is Samo. The obvious comparison we might think of is Banksy. To think that they're 17 years old, they're incredibly young. He's already playing with this question of how he should be treated, what others are projecting onto him, how he's read. It's clearly a very performative project. He dropped out of school quite young, and that's often, I think, um, sullied our understanding of him because people have thought of him as this kind of ill-educated guy, when actually, of course, he has one of the most sophisticated educations because he's teaching himself. I never went to an art school. I failed the art courses that I, that I did take in, in school. Um, I, just looked at, I just looked at a lot of things. And that's what, and that's what I think I learned about art, by looking at it. And we know he came from a very cultured home in Brooklyn. They went to museums from a very young age. I think there's a sense in which he felt anything could belong to him. You know, anything, he could take it and find a way to make it useful for his work. He would write something off the back of a menu from a Chinese restaurant, but he might put next to it a drawing taken from uh, Galileo. He knows how to pick these particular fertile words or references that almost feel like kind of hyperlinks. They almost feel like these kinds of rabbit holes that can dive down and take you in all of these different directions simultaneously. Rawbone of an Ass is a painting that's swarming with references that has a very direct citation, which is to the King James Bible from the story of Samson with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. There are these lists of names, all kind of jumbled up together. Ancient warriors, figures you might have heard of. You have this pensive figure and above it is half scrawled out Rodin's thinker, which is of course the icon for philosophy. 
And when you think about these two strands together, of course, it paints this picture of a war of the mind, which is what the story of Samson is, is said to be about. And in that sense, I think it's dealing with the idea of the collision of thought, the sense of simultaneity that we might have in our mind, that you could have all of these different clashing ideas and images all occurring simultaneously. I think one of the reasons why we feel him as such a contemporary figure is because that's, of course, our primary experience of the digital age, is that sense of the simultaneity of information. Almost all of the work he made was about jazz, and within jazz, most of it's about the great bebop pioneers. We have a piece in which he takes this formidable silhouette head, which he started to make around 1983, and he frames it. And on the one hand, there are song titles from Thelonious Monk, And on the other is just the repeated name of Ben Webster. And you have this sense of what does it mean for him to frame his head amongst these heroes of jazz. Because the piece is hinged, it almost feels like an altarpiece. It almost feels like these are kind of saintly, heroic figures for him. But there also seems to be a question of whether he too might be a star that shines bright but burns young. Often there is a kind of simmering politics within the work and he's looking a lot at both kind of great black cultural achievement. He's wanting to celebrate these great bebop pioneers. This was one of the limited spheres in the US where black celebrity was attainable. I don't know, see, I know black people are never really portrayed realistically. Not, 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 or they're not even portrayed, I mean, not even portrayed in modern art. If you look at a piece like Hollywood Africans, you think at first that this is just about a time when he's spending with some friends on the West Coast. But of course, it also has things like at the top, it says Hollywood Africans 1940. And 1940 is the year in which the first African American wins an Oscar, an Academy Award. But it's Hattie McDaniel, and she wins it for the role of Mammy in Gone with the Wind. I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel. And may I say thank you. <laughs> On the one hand, is he celebrating this achievement? On the other hand, is he kind of betraying some degree of sadness that it might be for that role? Or is 1940 only meant to just be a reference to this great uh, golden era of Hollywood? We will never know. And in a way, that's part of what's so interesting about the way in which he samples from these different things. He's both wanting to exonerate and celebrate the instances of great black achievement, but he's also wanting to tinge that with questions of maybe what did it take to become this person or to become this figure in history? We often feel that sadness. I, know, I, try to, I like to try to be, to remain a little reclusive, a little reclusive, and not be just, and be out there, you know, just to, you know, to be, to be brought up and to be brought down, you know, like they do to, do to most of them. Yeah, because sometimes they can tell on you. Well, they, they always do. I can't think of one big celebrity type person who they haven't done that to. They turn on you. Uh, here and there. There are many reasons why we might think that Basquiat remains so incredibly relevant today. His relationship to his identity. So he saw identity as uh, essentially a fictional construct. But there's also this question about how you assimilate the experience of all of this information around us. 
um, and being an engaged participant in that. So drawing from everything in the world around you and finding a way to turn it into some degree of meaning, some sense that makes us feel like we need to act. So he is very influential still on a lot of people, even though he passed away in the late 1980s, maybe early 90s. Um, but that weaving of text and sort of doing stream of consciousness text at the time for any kind of artwork, Jenny Holzer and Barbara Kruger, which came before and I'm sure had some influence there, um, were much more structured in how they placed their text, even though they let viewers make connections he completely just went by the wayside and let viewers made all the connections. He didn't apologize for whether something belonged together. He juxtaposed found text. And then living in New York City, kind of having all that information coming at you all the time um, and all the digital information and television information that we absorb, he put all of that into his artwork without apologizing to anybody for it and really came up with some pretty amazing compositions on the materials too that he used um, were not traditional art materials. He used found items and paper and scrap wood and all sorts of stuff that he's putting together, but uniting them so cleverly with his texturing and his patterning that they become to people at the time and still very powerful works of art. So he's still very collected and it's kind of interesting for somebody that, you know, he he did start to make a lot of money, I would say, you know, before he passed away a lot and he was selling his works for in the hundreds of thousands and because he hooked up with some major artwork figures that were dealing his work and with Andy Warhol. But, um, you know, after he passed away, then his work is just skyrocketed and continues to grow. I mean, selling for millions of dollars at various auction houses. So in a way that's sad, I think, um, but, you know, the, he, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just too much um, too soon, which happens to a lot of people. I mean, not a lot of people, but a lot of people that have that happen experience it that way. But his work still endures and it's interesting to look at because at first it seems like nonsense, but when you start to look at it, you can see this stream of consciousness that he was probably thinking about um, particular things at the time that he was experiencing. So it's very narrative. Um, so anyway, I'm going to, um, do you have any comments or anything else that you'd like to talk about before we kind of, I have a PowerPoint that has, I've listed all the major things that we've done in Photoshop so far. So I'll share the screen for that and then go into Photoshop and share the screen there to just touch on some of those. I'll bring up some of the images that I already worked on in class um, to go through those key points that you need to know about, not PowerPoint, Photoshop, um, for this class. And then next week, the um, one word assignment is due. And then the following week, we're going to start working with, we're going to use Photoshop to do vector graphics and try to design a small graphic with vector graphics that you can have print on a product, a t-shirt of your choice or something. Um, from that with a repeat pattern. So we're going to kind of switch gears after um, next week. But anyway, I wanted to go over before we did that, the basics of Photoshop that we've looked at so far. So, okay. Um, let me go back to share screen and I'll go back to Bridgewater once more. And let's see. Whoops, where did I put that? I think I didn't put it in power. Yeah, for some, yeah, this wasn't coming up with my, 
I put it in as a PDF, so I put it in reading so you could access it. There it is, <laughs> Photoshop Essentials. This sort of is just an overview of everything that we've done so far. So if you feel like you want to, you know, check it to see that you've tried at least all of these, at least tried them techniques. This is really the basics of Photoshop, what you would need to go on and use it in different ways. Um, and sort of the foundation for other classes if you're majoring in graphic design or taking any other graphic design classes. Um, this is the foundation that you'll need to be using for that. So I started with Photoshop Essentials for the workspace. And I had a couple of comments that people didn't see the same tools that I was showing when they went to use their Photoshop. And this could be why, so I wanted to put this first. Photoshop allows you to have several different workspaces that are kind of optimized to the type of project that you're doing. Um, you know, I think it's nice that they do that. It kind of cuts down on the amount of information they would have in just one unified workspace, but it can be confusing too, because if you're in a workspace, say for photography, if it's been set that way, um, you won't see some of the stuff that you would have or choices for graphic and web or essentials. So what we're using in this class is the most broad uh, workspace that has the most tools and that's the essentials workspace and we'll stick with that. So if you don't find some of the tools that I have in the demonstrations, make sure you go to check to, that you're in essentials workspace. And the way that you do that is to go to the upper right hand and we'll look at that when I switch over in Photoshop. You'll see a little symbols like this, one with the um, zoom in, the next, and then the download over here. The one in the middle is the change workspace. If you click on that, you can see there's a V here that suggests there's a sub menu. Click and hold on it and you'll see this list of different workspaces. So click on essentials and then you'll have all the tools that we're using in class in your toolbar and all the windows available that you need for the projects that we're doing. So that's the, probably the most important thing, especially if you feel like you're getting stuck. So familiarize yourself with that. And then there's obviously the file menu, which is really the workhorse of the whole program where you create new files, save files, format files, import files, and then your place embedded is there to your left of the text menus in Photoshop. And then the image image size menu, we'll go through that again today. That's an important menu to change the size of an image to determine what output size you want for an image and then also the measurement type, whether you're using inches or pixels, et cetera, for different applications. And then the image rotation menu is in the image, image rotation menu is in the image menu at the top of the Photoshop bar. And this allows you to take your whole file, everything that's in it, all the layers, not the individual layers, but everything and then flip it horizontally rotate it or flip it vertically. And it's important to remember that this includes all layers in the change. There's also canvas size. You can change under the same image menu and that also changes the size of everything in all the different layers, but also you're doing that in image size. So I don't use that that much, but the image rotation menu, again, if you wanna change the orientation of the entire work, your entire file, that's where you do that. As opposed to the edit transform menu, which we've been using a lot. So you should be familiar with that. I'd say it's one of the more important menus in Photoshop. This allows you to manipulate the images in individual layers, not the whole thing. When you go in, you're gonna click on the layer that you want to be in, make sure that that one's highlighted in your layers menu. And then this menu allows you to rotate, flip, change the size of objects, warp them, um, bend them, put them into perspective, all sorts of things, and then also flip them horizontally and vertically um, and tilt them on their side, whatever you need to do to change the positioning. But the edit transform menu is for the individual layers. The other one, the image rotation is for the whole, all the layers included, the whole file. 
Uh, the toolbar menu obviously is the menu that sits along the left hand side. Usually it defaults to, but you can put it anywhere you want. In Photoshop, it's a floating menu, but that has all your basic sort of hand tools, your paintbrush and drawing tools. You know, for this class, mainly these are the tools we're using. The object selection tools and that wonderful, I love that dodge and burn tool, <laughs> um, is there at, for creating highlights and shadows and the typography tool is there in your toolbar. And then the type tool, you know, it's so important, the type tool, obviously using Photoshop for a graphic design program, which is, you know, perfectly legitimate and using it with, if you go into graphic design, you'll be using InDesign. But the type tool, you know, it's not as complex as something you'd have if you go on either with Illustrator or InDesign when you get into graphic design, but it does a lot. Um, add type to a file with the keyboard is the main thing that it does. And it's the T in the, um, the toolbar. Change the type color and size. Change your typeface and your, the font attributes. Fonts are just the individual letters within a typeface. And, you know, graphic designers get picky about how you refer to type, but there's typefaces and their fonts. They're pretty much related. The typeface is the whole body of that style of type, and the font is the individual characters. Um, bending and distorting to customize the type. We saw that with Wendy's graphic. That was a great use of that. You can bend type bubble it, distort it to fit so it looks like it's wrapped around three-dimensional objects or three-dimensional in space. So that's a really nice tool and that's that little T with the bend up in the options menu for type. And the layers, again, that's the most powerful aspect of Photoshop is being to, able to stack up and layer all these transparent images. Um, Liliana's layered images with the silhouettes with beautiful examples of multiple layered images. They get really rich. You can see down through them. So with the layers menu, you can add blank layers and then have blank layers sitting on top of your existing layers if you want to draw on them or do something that you're not sure of. It's always good to add a blank layer so you're working on top and not in an existing layer. Um, you can duplicate the layers, merge and flatten the layers together or add layer masks like we've been doing with the silhouettes, which is just working with the gray scale in Photoshop rather than working with the full color um, palette and using the layer styles in individual layers. So there's other things you can do with the layers menu, but that's the main thing for us. And the rasterize I put here, it's under the layers menu. Again, rasterizing changes your placed images when you go to place embedded to bring a new image into a layer. Um, you need to change it after you've sized it into a bit mapped image that you can easily work with because if you don't, Photoshop will block you from doing certain things with it. So after you size it and hit return to set it, you want to go up to the layer menu at the top of Photoshop and rasterize the image, which changes it into a fully bitmapped image that you can work with. Filter menus, um, the filter galleries, we just started looking at them, give you the special effects for individual layers of sharpening and blurring the images can improve um, you know, allow you to drop out certain images into a blur in the background, but also sharpen up a digital photo that looks blurry directly from your camera. You can make it look sharper and more professional with the filters, distorting the shapes of images with the distort menu, adding textures, and then also you can use those automated lighting effects if your computer can handle them. Some computers don't have enough memory but they can give you sort of a realistic glowing light on, with a directional light on your images. But you can always, if it doesn't work for you, there is an automated filter. You can use the dodge and burn tool to do the same thing. And usually that works out better anyway. The view menu is how you view the file on the screen. So that's in your upper text menu in Photoshop, um, whether you wanna zoom in, zoom out, the, I put it here because this is something that people complain about a lot with Photoshop. If you're drawing or trying to move something and you feel like it's jumping from part of the screen to another part of the screen out of your control and you can't get it to drop in between a certain space, 
it's because Snap is activated and Photoshop defaults to Snap. That drives me crazy. I mean, it helps with graphic design if you have things that have to be perfectly spaced and you're using multiple in, you know, pieces of an image. But when you're not, you just want to move things around freely and have a flow to it. Snap is a real problem. So go up to the view menu if you find that happening. And then if you see Snap with a check mark next to it, click over it and that will free up your cursor so you don't get that sticky jumpy effect with your cursor because that is a pain and it makes you want to sometimes throw the computer so um yeah click over the word snap and that will take that out and then if you ever find you need it with your accurate really for accurately lining things up if you're putting multiple things together you can put snap back on um windows menus um, that's the last one here. That's the one that's in the upper right of the text menus in Photoshop. And those have all your floating menus. So when you first go into Photoshop, depending, you know, especially if you're working in ones at school that other people use, people will set up the windows the way that they like them and open and close them. So if you don't see the toolbar or you don't see the options for the toolbar, which comes up underneath on the top of the window, or if you don't see the color menus, for instance, you can open all of those up under the windows and there's a lot of different floating windows there. The layers, the options, the toolbar are the main ones that you want open. And then probably a color menu that you can pick colors from for paint brushes. So you can activate, there's many other windows that you can activate and there's a separate text window and character is the, um, the window that you can use to manipulate text with and change the spacing between letters and so forth. But again, you have to set up Photoshop the way that you want to. So if you don't see some of those, it's probably because somebody has been using a computer and put the windows the way they want them. So that's where you get to reopen those. So those are the main things. I think that was it for the, yeah, this is here is a PDF under readings if you want to check it or check your work against it. But that's the main stuff for using Photoshop that you need to know to make it a workable dynamic program that you know you can get. And you already have done, it seems like the people that have submitted work really have great control over what you've done and be, have done some beautiful images. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop this for a second and then we'll go into Photoshop and review some of this stuff there. Is there anything that you struggle with in particular that you want me to look at or any questions that you have about Photoshop, especially if you haven't been, um, you know, submitting work or, you know, feel like you're nervous about it. Because you can get some really interesting effects just using some of the basic stuff you can do with Photoshop. So don't panic. I mean, if you see some things like layer masking tends to be the most complicated thing you can do with Photoshop and the most complex set of instructions you need to have for yourself to move forward with it. So, you know, take your time with that and do other things like you know, piecing separate images together and using the eraser around them, you know, rather than worrying about the layer masking until you get a feeling for that. But I'm going to go, I think I have Photoshop open here. Let me shut this one first. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm going to share a screen and go into Photoshop and just review some of that the basics that were there in the PowerPoint. Okay. So let me see, I'm going to try to find one of the earlier assignments that we did at the beginning of the semester. The semester it feels like it's been really long <laughs> and it's just because of the computer because there's not as much difference I think between the days when you're going into school than working on the computer but um, anyway let's go back to not one well maybe uh,
No, I'm going to go into this one. Okay, back to the black and white one. It seems like so long ago again, but I just wanted to put the black and white one up, I think, so we could see how color works on top of this in a blank layer. Um, but here's what we we're talking about in the other menu. I mean, in the, the PowerPoint. So what you want to always have, the basic things right here is just your options up here if that's not showing, that is part of the Windows menu. Down here, you'll see options. So if I unclick that, there you will click on tools and not see that options bar come up. And that can be very disorienting and confusing. So make sure that if you don't see that, go up to Windows and open that options. And now you'll have more control over your individual tools. This toolbar again defaults to the left-hand side that is also under Windows. They put these down here in the you know, important area, I guess. Um, if you don't see it, sometimes it's because it's floating around elsewhere on the screen, but it should be over here. And just go up to Windows and Tools, and you can turn that back on and off. And I have the color, the swatches, the gradients. Photoshop will group menus that work together together, so you don't have so many floating menus. Um, running around your screen that it becomes just too uh, cluttered workspace, kind of like a cluttered desktop. So things that work well together are properties and adjustments, paths, channels, layers, they tend to be grouped. And that's what I like about the essentials workspace. You can shut individual ones of these off. You can see if you go to Windows, they're all there and you can turn them on and off. Um, the other really important one is layers that should be on because that allows you to see which layer you're in when you place an image and to select it. So you really have to use that layers menu and that shows you how your image is building up. Um, but the other ones you can turn on and off when you need them or you want more room to work. So I'm going to shut this characters one for temporarily with these little double arrows just sends it to the side because I'm not using text right now. And I don't want it in my way. But this is the basic essentials workspace. And that's my favorite one out of all of these. I do like the specialization of the other ones, but they have fewer choices. So I usually, for no matter what I'm doing, I usually use essentials. If I'm doing 3D type, Photoshop will ask you if you want to switch over to the 3D menu, I mean workspace. And it can be helpful for the type when you're working in 3D, it gives you some other options. But when you try to go back and do other things, they're not there in your toolbar. So this is that little icon that I showed in the PowerPoint. If you click and hold on it, there's your options. You, if your essentials, if you've changed any of them and you want to go back to the original, that's where the reset is. Um, essentials is the one that we're working in. There's 3D motion, photography, and graphic and web, just like in the PowerPoint, but leave that on essentials for this class, and then you'll have all the things that I demonstrate with in class. And that really gives you your most options. Okay. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to position this so it's not driving me crazy. Let's see, I'll put it up here, oops. Uh, Let's see. Um, okay, for people that are new to Photoshop, um, that you know are just getting your computers up to speed or haven't had it installed completely yet, here's what we mean when we say rasterizing. And I wish I could zoom in on this a little bit. I can't, but you can see in this layer that says prison bars here, it's this image here. Um, it's got a tiny square in the lower right-hand corner that is an indicator that this is still considered a smart object, sort of between a vector graphic and a bitmap graphic. In order to go back and erase that layer, for instance, I need to set this object so it doesn't have this um, smart ob object designation. I need to rasterize it. So I'm gonna go up to the layers menu and scroll down to where it says rasterize. And when I come over to the right and scroll down in the sub menu, I click on smart object. 
and that will take that off of there. Now, if you squint and look at this little layer icon, you can see that's gone, that little square. And now that indicates that this is a fully bitmapped image and I can use tools with it. So I'm gonna keep this layer selected. Again, for people that are new to Photoshop, you select the layers by clicking over the name in the layers menu of the layer that you want to be working in. You really can only be working in one layer at a time, you can select two layers and merge them together and do other things with them or move them in the layer stack together by holding the shift key down. But I really can just be working with one layer at a time. So I'm going to click on that bars layer now and then come over to the eraser tool in my toolbar which you've all been using a lot but here it is the eraser tool that looks like that sort of double black and white square. I'm going to push the size up and kind of make that a very soft edged brush by moving that hardness slider down, moving the size up and just leaving it on a plain round brush up in my options. So that's why those options are so important that they're there. Again, if you're new to Photoshop, each one of these tools has a separate options menu up here at the top. So you need to have that open so that has space to give you these options. But now I can come here and I'm going to set the opacity up here in the options to a more trans or a less transparent brush, I should say. Um, about 30%. And so now I can go in and erase some of this content that's here in the prison prison bars um, layer but keep some of it there too. I just want this to be a little bit more subtle. If I hadn't removed uh, the smart object change by rasterizing it, I wouldn't be able to do this. It wouldn't let me erase. Okay, so I'm not gonna go back all through this image. I'm just using it as an example. Um, so the other thing that I had in the layers and the PowerPoint that you will be using a lot, again, is your two layers menu. You have your text layer, a lot of these overlap layers menu up here. This is where you have to go to add a layer mask if you want to do a silhouette or um, you, you know, make it a replaceable and erasable layer, which I'll look, show in a minute. But you have a lot of those options over here too in the sub menu for layers, which is this little square. So you can see um, that's more convenient because it's right there in your layers menu. And then it's got some other things that you can't do with the other layer, which is typical Photoshop, kind of <laughs> not grouping everything or duplicating everything, but um, doing some. But anyway, I'm gonna duplicate layer here, which is or actually, I'm going to add a brand new layer because we haven't done that yet. Okay, so that is a brand new blank layer on top of the prison bars layer. And anything I do in this is going to affect everything that's below it. So I wanted to just selectively add some color to the image that's very subtle. But I don't want to paint right on top of the layers that already exist because I might not like what I want to I'm going to do or I might want to make it let more transparent in the layers menu. So I'm going to do a separate layer and anytime I want to paint directly on something with the paintbrush tool and I've already got layers there, I always make a new layer like this. And you can see it's got that kind of check marked background that indicates transparency in Photoshop. So I'm going to go up because I can't remember if I made this image entirely black and white as a grayscale file or whether it will allow me to use color. And the, we haven't looked at that yet. That's also under image in the mode menu. This shows me what type of image this is. Is it grayscale? Indexed color is GIF images for the internet which I don't use that often. I just trans, you know, make them as RGB images and then convert them. Uh, but RGB color is your red, green, and blue, your digital color that makes your full palette of million colors when combined with grayscale. 
or CMYK color is cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is kind of a dark gray that printers like to use so you don't get too dark printing. So if you're taking your work out to a professional printing lab, sometimes they will require you to work in a CMYK format because it works better with their particular printer. Same with lab color, is that's for specific printers. So when we start working on the t-shirt projects, we will probably be working in CMYK for posting things digitally online or sharing um, or printing on an inkjet printer, RGB color is good. Um, this, I didn't change to grayscale, so I can add color. If I had changed this to a grayscale mode image, I wouldn't be able to add color to it. But I could if I went back and changed this to change my grayscale image into an RGB color. You know, all is never lost. You can go back and change it at any time. So this is set on RGB so I can add color to it, even though the rest of the layers are black and white. So just to get that kind of like old fashioned sort of hand painted photograph look, I'm going to go choose a color here from the bottom of my toolbar, the swatches and pick up something that's kind of a warm color. And then switch to paintbrush tool, which in Photoshop actually looks like what it is, the paintbrush. And then push this up again um, to a larger brush size, softer edged, and then also set the opacity down to about 20%. If you want that hand painted look, then I can just sort of go over it. And even that's pretty harsh. So I'm going to even make this less, maybe 12% to make it look like an old photo. And I really like the starkness of black and white, but sometimes this works. I mean, as a technique, especially in portraits. So now I'm going to go back and get another color and it's really like painting with pastels or watercolor if you change the options so your paintbrush is very subtle and transparent. You can overlap colors and kind of blend them so they look like watercolors that are sort of washing together with a really subtle look and get new colors as you let your colors flow over other colors. And let me go pick up a blue. So I'm not going to be real accurate with this. I just wanted to show how you can kind of get this effect if you do want to use that in future images. And you can see as I go over the image, it's kind of because this is a light color and it has a lot of light value, a lot of white in it, just like white paint when you mix um, white with a darker color. It's going over the gray scale that's below it and evening it out. It's kind of making the whites that are um, lighter a little bit darker and making the darks a little bit lighter. And so that kind of is making it a less dynamic composition because it's really evening out my grayscale. I feel like on this layer too much. So she's above that. That's why she's not catching it. Um, but I can always change this in the layer stack by just clicking and holding it and moving it above. Okay. So again, just like with a photographic image that you've cut and embedded into your layer stack. With this layer that started out as a blank layer and now is a color layer, I can still use these modes over here to kind of blend it differently with the grayscale behind it. So if I change this from normal, it's kind of washing out the grayscale, I can use darken, which will apply the color to just the lights and very subtly to the darks and bring back the grayscale, so that might work. Multiply does that. It's exaggerating some of the colors a little bit more into the mid grays, which I kind of like. And then the other ones, again, just like with the photograph relate to, they sort of start making different combinations of um, this layer with the ones below it and gives me different effects. So I can go through and just sort of let my cursor roll over these and see which I like best for this particular image. 
And I always end up going to overlay for some reason. I really, I like overlay because it allows a lot of the original grayscale, the high contrast to stay there, but does make the color apply to the light without washing it out. And this one's a much more graphic look always, the hard mix, which I like for some images, but kind of like it for this, but not love it. <laughs> this one will just flip the whole palette on its, um, to its opposite color. And that just, it's again, going back to taking those colors and putting their value um, and considering that is a gray value overlay, which I don't want, but I did really kind of like the overlay. So I would leave that on that layer. So once that's there is a color layer, it's still separate as long as I'm in working with the Photoshop file. So I can click on it and deactivate it by deactivating, clicking on that little eyeball icon to the left. And there it is in black and white again. If I go to save it at this point as a JPEG, it's just gonna be black and white. It's not what you see and what is what you get with the JPEG on the screen. So I could have two versions of it, a color version, save this as a JPEG, turn this off, have the black and white. So it's really flexible working in the layers, which again, if you're new to the Photoshop and you're just getting started up with it, that's why we work with this layered format and save it when you're ready as, when I go to save as, and that's another thing on the PowerPoint that's an essential um, in your file menu. I wanna make sure that I save a working file. And I know this is a repeat for some of you, but if you're new to it, save it as a working file is a Photoshop format document, and that will save all your layers intact. And you'll see a .psd extension after it, which indicates that yes, this is a Photoshop document and all these layers will be intact when you open it back up to work on it. If you save it in a different type of format, like JPEG, or PNG are both formats that work well to compress the image for sharing on the internet, emailing, sending to a printer, et cetera, but it will get rid of the layers. It's gonna compress them, give you exactly what you see there on the screen. So make sure you save the Photoshop format as a working file if you know you're gonna to wanna to change this up later or work with parts of it. You can even pull out separate layers and work with them in other images, which is nice. So a layer stack can almost be, or an image with a lot of layers, like a library or a folder for multiple images that you may wanna work on later. So save one version as a Photoshop. I'm gonna call this phase three so I don't write over the other one, just so I remember that I did this and it's separate. And then if I want to save this file to share out, I'm gonna go back to save as again. Um, and this time I'm gonna change the format to JPEG. And this is gonna save a flattened image, whatever is showing on the screen. And I'm gonna save it as a standard. That's really the best quality, optimizes, just sort of optimizes the colors in the palette for the internet, but baseline will keep it a good high quality image for printing or the internet. And I'm gonna leave this on maximum so I get the highest quality. If you have to send somebody a lower quality image, you can change this. Medium is still good. Low starts to look a little grainy. Um, but sometimes when you're posting your work online or sharing it on Instagram or whatever, you want to use a low quality image, just that is a copyright protection technique. <laughs> so somebody's not getting your best quality image that they can reproduce easily, especially at a larger size. Sometimes people will do that. Well, you see that a lot when you go to get images off the web. Um, another good reason why it's always good to take your own photos in the long run for your content. But anyway, so I'm gonna save this at maximum and say, okay, that gives me a JPEG image. So now I have two versions of it, working file and the usable file that is going in this application for online. Um, when we go to work on the t-shirt image, we will probably save in a different format. 
a lot of, sometimes people want JPEGs for doing commercial printing, but sometimes they want a TIFF file, which is a full file size. It doesn't compress the image down like a JPEG where you lose some image quality and some image data. This keeps that original and high quality, but it's a flattened image that's optimized for printing. So we may be doing that depending on which company we go with. Anyway. Um, let me go back up one more time. To the final assignment, which you're working on now. And I'm just gonna open up that other vote. This was the 3D text. But I just wanted to um, add if you haven't worked with Photoshop yet with the text tool or you weren't here last class, here is the type tool so you can get started on this assignment because this one should go pretty quickly. You're just merging text with a background image that reflects its content. That background image can be multiple layers. It can be as complex as you want or that contradicts it. So you have a more ironic message like some of Basquiat's messages were very ironic. All of those artists that we looked at use irony extensively in their artwork to get the viewer's attention to kind of make you read it and think about what are they actually trying to say. So that is definitely an option. Obviously vote here is like right in your face. It is what it is. So either way, um, but I just wanted to again, look at the text tool for people that weren't here last class and then we'll probably call it a day unless you have other questions. But if you click and hold on this text tool, this is something else you can do. What we did to put we did use place into to add images into text. And I think what I'm going to do is just add a new blank layer on top of this or um, a gradient layer so I can block out the rest of this image behind it for now. So maybe purples. Okay. So you can also type vertically and you can type horizontally. I mean, like you normally would do, but you can also type a selection and it's a mask tool. So what we did last time was just type type and then I selected it with the magic wand tool to drop a image into it. You can also type as a mask. Oops, I'm gonna put this on. And I'm gonna change this font. I'm sick of looking at <laughs> um, Let's see. Yeah, something that's more blocky. Um, and just type vote again. Okay, so now when I go back to the selection tool, you can see that this is actually, um, when I click on the move tool, sorry, not the selection tool, the move tool, after I type that in as a mask, it's automatically a selection which can be a mask and it's got a mask um, part of the layer now showing that this can potentially be masked if I just add something into this. So I could fill this with color or I can go and copy and paste into it. So this is just an easier step, um, you know, rather than having to type it out with one solid color, then going back in with the magic wand tool to select it. This is just much easier to type it as a selection to begin with. So I'm gonna open up a background image that I wanna drop into it. Um, <laughs> these aren't exactly suitable, but I'll put them in anyway for this particular, yeah, this one would be good. Okay, so I'm just gonna go up to select all, edit, copy, and then come back to my type, which is still selected on this layer, um, the floating layer. And now I'm going to edit, paste special, and paste into, to drop that layer into the, um, the selected text that I typed as a selection. And you can see now down here in the layers menu that as soon as I put content in it, 
it's showing me what was selected as white, where I've dropped new content in it is the mask and the black surrounding it. So this color information is still manipulable with the mask there. So if I go up to edit, transform, and scale to scale that image down because it was so much bigger, the smokestack image, than my file size for this vote because this was designed for a Twitter um, post, which is very small in terms of pixels, and that was a bigger image. But I can get more of it in there by just doing that, and then I can still move it around. As long as I have this mask, and this is the nice thing about masks, set up in my layers, and I haven't flattened that out, I can keep moving this and changing it as my design evolves. And that's what I like so much about um, having the masks in Photoshop. They're just really flexible for a design tool, as long as I keep this as a layered file. So that's really simple and I kind of like it. I like the sort of acidy looking background and the um, smokestacks, which just show a little clip of them with the big blocky type. So it's not a direct message, but you kind of, you know, you would read into it, you know, a certain content about voting, um, voting me out something you don't want. Most people don't <laughs> vote for pollution. But anyway, um, if I want to offset this, I kind of look how, I like how it looks really flat on the background, but if I want to offset it a little bit, this is why you might use your layer styles. So if you haven't tried these yet under the layer menu, you know, on this assignment, play around with it. It may not work for you, but you may want to use it. So I can go and transform the text a lot by using bevel and emboss to make it look like it's rounded. But in this case, I really like the flat. I think this kind of works with the kind of smoky look, but I lose the smokestacks themselves and I like the clean look of this. So bevel and emboss gives a sort of fake 3D look to the images. So if you want a 3D look and your computer won't handle the actual 3D tool, this is a really good option. So now I'm gonna go, probably what I would rather use for this is an outer glow or a drop shadow. The outer glow defaults to a light color, but you can change that to a darker color. And I kind of want this like purpley color here because it's still got kind of that rancidy purple that looks like this sky smoke, but I don't want it to be this dramatic. And the reason why it is is because this spread allows the, it's sort of like ink spreading out um, from something that you would put underneath the text. So if I don't want it to spread out so much, I can change that back to a much more subtle look by turning spread back to zero. Size is much nicer because it just puts a very subtle glow around something that's very transparent and you can size it up and make it really take over the whole page or you can allow it to be kind of a shadow that's not a drop shadow. A drop shadow is directional, but an outer glow surrounds the whole letter and just offsets it from the background. And then I can make this less opaque because I like the way the layers kind of the letters blended with that background. I don't want it to be too drastic. I just wanted it to float a little bit more. So I can make that really subtle. And something as simple as that, you know, if you're just starting out with Photoshop again and you want to do this project can be an interesting text message for somebody and you don't have to use layers and layers and a lot of fancy techniques, just basic text, you know, filled, doing the text as a selection or just typing it out in a color and then selecting it with the magic wand tool. And then using the paste in too to create a mask to drop in another image can be really interesting. And then just adding a layer style. So it, um, you know, is more dynamic with whatever background you have it on. And like all the other things in Photoshop, when you have layers, there's always a blend modes menu <laughs> where you can change the way that it blends in terms of mode. When I'm in here, it's not gonna let me sort of roll the cursor over it to preview, but like I can if I was just directly over in the layers menu. But if I click on these effects, I can see how they would look if I changed them, um, the color uh, mode. 
which isn't going to be real drastic because there's a lot, not a lot of pattern or anything in it, but I could change it up. That makes it look a little bit brighter, which I kind of like with the pin light. So maybe I would use that. Okay, because that sort of, rather than having a darker purple shadow, it kind of looks luminous like the other colors. So at this point, I mean, I would just go ahead and save it again, save to, if you save as, again, Photoshop document, even your mask layer will stay intact with the mask there. So this is always a dynamic working file. If you don't want to save over the top of something you've already done, and again, this is for the beginning Photoshop students, make sure you change the name in some way because I have a lot of vote PSD one, two, three, and I can't remember um, which one is which. I'm just going to put vote color there so I don't save over the top of those. But if I save it with the layers intact here as a Photoshop document, everything will be there if I go back to work on it again, including this mask. And this is your silhouette mask, just using type instead of a picture. And then one more time to save it for something that I can share on social media, which would be either a JPEG or a PNG format image. And you can see this one's just small in terms of pixels, so it's very small. Unlike the other image we looked at that was black and white that was 2.5 megabytes, which is still mailable as a Photoshop document, I mean as a JPEG, this one's tiny because it's just um, 1500 by 500 pixels, so much smaller. So I would probably leave that at maximum. But again, if I wanted to share it out and make it more difficult for people to copy, I would turn it on to low and that's very small in terms of file size and also gets kind of grainy and blocky as you can see it's separating the gradient here. And that's what happens when you have a lower quality image. You start to see the pixels become apparent or how the colors are placed together. It simplifies the color palette and the grayscale. And this is really blocky. So I'm just gonna put this up to maximum and save it as a JPEG. And that is that. So um, I'm going to go out of the share for a second. So do you have any questions? Okay, let's see. Kaylee says, um, being a little bit behind, what do you recommend is the most versatile for something like the last project? Um, so for the text project, oh, is that an old comment? Okay. Um, but I think that's a really good question. I mean, Photoshop is very versatile. I think just stacking layers, you can do even the silhouette layer. I mean, the silhouette project, you can paint in a shape. It doesn't have to be photographic. You could create a, a silhouette with a black paintbrush and then select that with the magic wand tool and then use paste into to drop in a new image. So that might be the more versatile or um, simpler thing to do, or at least it's a good way to practice to get a feeling for that tool before you start using it a lot. So I guess, you know, if you are working and having trouble with that, you find if you want to drop in next Tuesday, I can focus in on just working with the silhouette and the masking tools. And um, that might be a good way to go about that because that is the most complex thing that we do in Photoshop is the masking, uh, the silhouetting, using the layer masks. But for now, I mean, having a selection, filling in with um, paste into is the easiest way to get a mask. <laughs> but okay, well, thanks. And is there any other questions? I'm really happy to see your work today. Really beautiful work. I'm so happy with it. I mean, it's just, um, you know, Fantastic to look at, fun to look at, really intriguing and nice command of the tools so far. So um, if you haven't worked with Photoshop and uploaded anything, just upload it to your um, final portfolios and we won't go in and raid your final portfolios for the critiques. I, you know, again, <laughs> just let me know um, if it's there so I can, you know, I, I can even share, you know, conversation back and forth and email about your work if you don't want to show it in this forum at first at least, so that's another option. But just let me know that it's there when you post it. So, 
Yeah, I can. I, I know what you mean about midterms. It, this is the hardest time of the semester. I think midterms is higher than the end. I mean, harder than the end of the semester because you have that extra week to work on things for finals week. But midterms, you know, everything comes together at once. So don't panic. You know, again, you can revise these things till the end of the semester. You're really just putting up stuff for the assignments. So we have something to share and talk about because I think you learn a lot more that way. That's the main thing about it. So, you know, anybody that's struggling with midterms, don't panic about it in terms of this class. You'll get it done. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, but yeah, and drop in on Tuesday if you want some extra help. You know, I always have that class and usually it's like one or two people at the most. So you can focus in on what you really need to catch up with. So that's a good opportunity. Or if you want to do that at any other time, you know, I'd be happy to set up a Zoom date if you just let me know a day in advance so I can, you know, make sure I have the free time for that. That works for both of us. That would be good. So any other questions? comments <laughs> okay i'll put this video up in about an hour it takes that long to sort of process it and get it onto youtube and then i'll send you a message when it's there just review the last thing we wanted to do if you i mean the last thing we did in this video if you want to do your text assignment that way and i will see you either next tuesday or next thursday and i hope you all have a great weekend and it's supposed to be nice out like this, this weird summer weather. So enjoy it while we've got it. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you guys. See you later. Thanks for sharing your work, everybody that did. It's awesome.